I note uh, that you eliminate the word sewer from your, <laughs> from your title, your marketing, your agency, <laughs> a little differently, I guess. Um, I can understand that, although I think it could create some um, confusion with um, Mr. Mr. Jacobus's work. Um, and some of us consider your work on sewers to be uh, of exquisite importance. So I don't know why, I know, I know sewer can sound like a dirty word, but, but the fact is that uh, it is that part of your jurisdiction that's, that some of us up here, especially uh, uh, me, because I am a, um, the prime sponsor of the Anacostia River uh, Bill, the comprehensive bill, the first uh, that the Congress has ever passed to clean up the, the river. There's some of us who, who like the notion of calling attention to the sewers, particularly considering uh, their effect uh, on, um, on the Anacostia River and ultimately on water. But I, you know, I just want you to know that some of us aren't fooled by your eliminating <laughs> sewer from your title. Um, I'd like to know when uh, CDC first informed you, or for that matter, uh, Mr. Tulu of the new findings that children in the homes with partial uh, lead line replacements had four times the likelihood of elevated uh, blood test levels. When did that occur? My recollection, um, I'll have to check because I can get a, a more specific answer, is was 2009, um, but I'll, I can confirm that. Yes, yes, I'm Mr. Tyler. And uh, I, uh, I'm, we're not aware of exactly what that time it was. Well, either, we have, so. that's the date that's been given to us. And Ms. Arias, I have to ask you, uh, what took CDC so long? You knew before September 2009 uh, about uh, the, this misinformation, shall we call it. On the why, partial wasn't, why wasn't the district notified uh, immediately? On the partial line replacement issue? Uh, on lead in the water in 2004. CDC was informed of the problem in 2004 by EPA. As soon as we were informed. Well, why did, Mr. Why did D the district only learn about this matter in 2009? And I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I think I'm, in my I'm, mind, I'm, I am talking about partial line replacements. Uh, about that, the that, line replacements. Yeah, right. we're, we're four times as likely than children in, in homes with lead service lines. Okay. So we, that they, so that uh, uh, Mr. Hawkins would know that. We did not have that information until much later, and it was information that, or, or data through 2006. So it was in 2007 when we did the initial analyses, and then we were waiting. That, that, you mean CDC? CDC only recently uh, had the view that partial line uh, replacements can, in fact, increase exposure to lead. You didn't know that uh, before 2009? No, that was a longitudinal study then that we did after uh, the MMWR. When did you do that issues. study? Um, I, mean, I, I remember I, that in, in, in the early 2000s, there was testimony in, in this committee uh, precisely of that matter that even while WASA was proceeding, there was no explanation given as to why that would not, why that would help and why that might not indeed exacerbate the situation. And it, you were unfamiliar with the fact that that partial replacement might indeed uh, exacerbate lead in the water? I can. I can send you as a follow-up a full detailed chronology of when it is that that information became available. Has CDC informed uh, um, jurisdictions around the, the country about the possible effects of partial, uh, partial uh, line replacement? Yes, we have. We have when did sent you do out, that? 
um, I can get that information to you again. There was an initial communication and then there's been a more recent one. Um, I think the first one was in 2009 and then more recently we have reached out again and again posted information on our web and sent out letters to uh, lead programs informing them of the findings. Let me ask um, uh, you, Mr. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Silvergill, uh, and you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Ares, is there anything that can be done now that these households have knowledge that they may have been exposed, is there anything that can be done that uh, can remedy the situation as far as they're concerned? What we are recommending in DC specifically is making sure that children, number, number one, that the water is tested and making sure that it's in compliance with the lead and copper rule. Um, we are also. No, no, no. I want to know. I want to. You know, the preventative. Oh, the preventative work is very important, and maybe this is all a case of prevention. Mm -hmm. I want to know if I was pregnant, two months pregnant in 2002, and I now have that child. What is it that I should do? Contacting a, a medical professional. Uh, and getting testing, number one, not only to look at current uh, lead levels in the blood, but then also looking at any potential developmental problems associated with, uh, with lead that may be present either in that child or in that adult woman herself. Now suppose I, suppose, suppose lead, lead, lead is found, then what? What then, can you do to get the lead out, can you? Then some case management, depending on the level, that would determine the, uh, the response uh, of exactly what would be done. But it certainly then it would be case management uh, and then continuing to do a very careful assessment of the home and removing all possible sources of lead. Ms. Silver, are, they, are these parents and children just out of luck or is there something you know of that could be done after the fact for such families? Well. In my testimony, I reviewed this in somewhat more detail than I did in speaking. Uh, but very briefly, to summarize, I think that it is the opinion of professionals in education, child psychiatry, et cetera, who have been dealing with this problem of children who were exposed to lead. And in fact, for most of these children, you can't get the lead out of the body. NIH sponsored a large clinical trial, of which Hopkins was a participant, to see whether pharmacologic treatment at lower levels of lead would, in fact, do anything to reduce lead in the blood and to improve the status of the child. The answer was no. So what we're looking now at are interventions that are targeted at what we know to be the at-risk outcomes for children with early lead exposure. And there have been schools and researchers, including the Kennedy Krieger School in Baltimore, which is affiliated with Johns Hopkins, which have developed specific curricula which speak to the particular behavioral and cognitive problems that have been widely described in children with these exposures. And so I would support Dr. Arias' statement of having a very early assessment, as early as possible, because we know in general for developmental disabilities that the earlier that an accurate diagnosis is made and a program is developed that fits the needs of the child, the more likely we are to mitigate and potentially remediate the effects of those earlier exposures. So I think that is an issue of very high priority. And in fact, it is a focus of the lead poisoning prevention program at CDC. Well, uh, I know that Mr. Uh, Tulu can perhaps answer this. Um, there is some kind of targeting focus on uh, homes, presume, to perhaps uh, have uh, be more vulnerable, have children more vulnerable to lead. Um, I don't know. I'd like to know how those homes are selected. For example, my family and I have lived in a what, what we on Capitol Hill call a historic house. You can't do things, certain things to these houses because uh, it was built so long ago. Why wouldn't the targeting simply be every child uh, under a certain age, whatever you, you choose, 
uh, in the District of Columbia? And if, that, if it is not that, how do you decide which children should be tested? Well, actually, the requirement is that every child under the age of two must be blood tested. Uh, so that's that means that today, if you, wh whether you go to a private physician, uh, oh, excuse me, or deliver as a Medicaid patient, you get those results. You get hundred percent results. Ms. Silver, Silver Gold is shaking her head you should, that you don't. Well, unfortunately not. Um, that has been the recommendation of the American Academy of Pediatrics, but CDC and others, that we should have universal screening because, as you rightly say, there's kind of a diffuse picture of risk. And living in an old house such as yours, and I too had children in an old house in Baltimore, I can tell you that there's lead paint present. And in any house that has lead paint present, there are higher levels of lead and dust than in a house that, that does not have lead paint present, no matter how well maintained it is. Those are studies that we have actually published. In addition, I think we, as I are mentioned- Are you saying that, there, that the federal law does not require universal testing? The federal law has been softened so that priority is given to Medicaid children and to other children receiving surfaces, services and as I mentioned in my testimony, there has been a risk assessment which was well designed by CDC in 1991, which focused really on priority to prevent exposure to lead-based paint. And so then- but not, All right, lead, lead from any place it would detect though, no. from any source. Well, uh, but what happened was the children that received the priority for screening were, I think as Mr. Tulu mentioned, primarily based on the assumption that the major source of risk to produce a blood lead in excess of 10 or even 15, which is the action level in many cities, uh, that was m more often than not associated with the presence of lead-based paint. However, if we become, as I suggested, if we become concerned, as I think we should, about levels down to the level of five, then that metric and that risk assessment is no longer fully predictive. And at that point, lead in drinking water, lead in other sources perhaps as well, become major contributors to the blood lead elevation. And this is going to be something that I'm sure that um, Dr. Arias, Dr. Frieden, and others are going to have to take into account as they develop new guidance and new recommendations. And I understand they're doing that. They're, they're developing new guidance. And I don't understand. I, I, the, the screening notion. I can understand the, the, the Medicaid for those uh, who get their health services uh, through the public, but I don't understand since we learned during the health care crisis, sorry, the health care bill uh, debate that most people have health insurance. I don't understand why you wouldn't simply say just like every child has to be vaccinated, every child has to uh, be tested let us say let us say a child below two has to be tested that has been said under epsdt and other programs but it has not been enforced as a universal requirement to the best of my knowledge Ms. dr arias um, i mean why in the world doesn't cdc simply uh simply mandate or they recommend or whatever you do uh that every child in the united states whether uh, uh, seen by a private physician or through some other source be tested for lead. If, particularly if, as I've heard it, prevention is the only cure here. Sure. We don't have the authority to do that. What we do, however, is make sure that we educate medical professionals to make sure that they do engage okay. in testing. Okay, you, uh, you know, I always hear this. From, I, I, you know, I, it, CDC, I get sick of CDC. Every time you ask them something, they tell you, well, they can't mandate something. I understand that. We've been with CDC through a lot of things um, in, in this town, when we, when, uh, I must tell you. Does CDC make recommendations to public health authorities as to what should be done? I'm just trying to get a straight answer. Yes, we do. And we do recommend universal testing for children up to the age of two. That's right. This is, this is, it seems to me, very, very important. This, this notion of universality is very important. I don't know whether you keep record of it, how often you do it. When's the last time you made such a recommendation and looked to see whether or not people were doing that? Uh, Dr. Arias. We work with the lead programs to make sure that they are aware. And, and 
that they are aware of our recommendations uh, and work with their coalitions to make sure that then those recommendations get adopted in those local jurisdictions. I have get to tell you, I'm very concerned uh, because I needed to hear and I have heard. Uh, let, no lead in the water now, at least if we use your standard, and I, I can understand you're working on that standard. But if you were pregnant or if you were a young child, uh, the most we can tell you is to, to get tested. That means that a very heavy, a very heavy burden is on the CDC, not only to make a recommendation once, once in the blue moon, but to check to see if this is being done. And so I would, I would urge in your protocols that you are preparing that something uh, other than uh, a recommendation that we may, may be made a moment in time uh, occur. Yeah, yes, Ms. Silvergo. Um, out of respect for my good colleagues at CDC, who I think have been heroic in these recommendations over the past 20 years, I think there would be room for some investigation oversight of the private insurance sector and some of the state health programs that are not funding this. And who would you suggest do that oversight? Do you think CDC has any role in that? No, I think that's something that has to come from the Congress. I mean, no, who, uh, who, the Congress can have hearings. That's what I mean. But if, in fact, CDC they, 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 they says there should be universal testing, well, then surely CDC doesn't say something that it then can't can't ask the jurisdictions to give them some information back upon Well, they, they do, and they do collect data on the prevalence of testing. I know my state reports on this, and I, I think, again, that the results are very discouraging. But just as oh, CDC... Dr. Aris, do you public... Uh, uh, Ms. Aris, do you, you public these results, publish these results? Uh, Dr. Silvergo says that, that, in fact, they do give their, their, their results to Yes, yeah, so for example, we know that in D.C. only 45 percent of one and two-year-olds How often do you tested. publish these results? I'll have to see what reports we actually do send out. I want to make sure that we're accurate I wish you'd, uh, within 30 days, tell us how often. It does seem mm -hmm. to us that just particularly since, of course, CDC is not an enforcement agency, uh, it, it, it would be important. Uh, it seems to me to make uh, to make jurisdictions know they're on the list by knowing, for example, that annually these results will be uh, posted. You now have an increasingly aware population that once they see they're not on the list of people, uh, I think mm -hmm. they will do our homework for us. I I, I wanted to to make sure I understand, Mr. Hawkins, uh, and the partial. Um, the partial line replacement. This, this is this is something that has bothered me for some time. You gave a very, it seems to me, intelligent and rational explanation. I didn't understand though. Are you saying that the public portion of the pipe is in any case exposed? So you got to replace it when you are doing other work underground. Is that why you got just got to do it? Right. That essentially is true. When we're replacing a water main in the street, the new main is very rarely put in exactly the same place that the old main was located. So, so if you think of the street and the main being two feet to the left of where the previous main had been, that means all the lines coming from either side of the street are no longer the right length to connect into the main because it's too close on one side and farther away on the other. So we, we have to replace those public lines just to make them the right length to connect into the system. For that reason, when we replace a water main, and we're going to be doing more water main replacements, not for lead, they're old and they're breaking and we need to improve the infrastructure in the city. When we do that, we will replace the lines because of this location question. When we replace the lines, some of those lines are lead which yields a partial no, lead service No, I understand that, Mr. Hawkins. And, yeah. and if I understand you to say there's no way around it, there's no way around it. I'm very bothered by the fact that, uh, that a remedy could have uh, such an effect. Uh, and of course, you have indicated there are a number of steps. And I commend you for the steps you have uh, taken. I just wonder whether or not people pay attention, I suppose, is my, is my a great problem. When it comes to water, there are assumptions made. They turned out not to be true in 2000 to 2004. Uh, and you had the nation's capital really ridiculed 
for having a water crisis. We wouldn't like to see that happen again, largely because we wouldn't want families to be put in position they were. And there was something close to panic in this city at the time, and then they were put to rest, and now, of course, there's concern again. That makes me want to ask Mr. Jacobus about the new chemical that made us feel more comfortable, uh, orthophosphate. And in light of Mr. Hawkins' testimony and the, the fact that orthophosphate is supposed to be a uh, inhibitor, uh, a uh, corrosion inhibitor, I wonder uh, uh, how effective you think orthophosphate has been since 2004 uh, on what Mr. Hawkins is doing uh, with respect to partial, partial replacement or for that matter on ordinary lines as they exist today. Sure. Uh, let me just borrow his microphone as a, as a water line. Uh, if, if this is the water main where my le left hand is, the, the water that comes from the treatment plant has this chemical orthophosphate. What orthophosphate does is when it passes through the, the water line uh, that goes into a house and into the house plumbing and comes to the tap, a chemical reaction occurs on the inside of that pipe. And it physically, the, the chemical in the orthophosphate compound physically integrates into the wall of the pipe. And so if that pipe is lead, after the orthophosphate has taken hold in there and the chemical reaction has accomplished itself, and that'll take a matter of months, and since we've been doing it since, 19, since 2004, it's, it's well established in there. From the water's point of view, the water going through the pipe, even though the pipe is lead, the water doesn't see lead. The water sees this protective film, which is a phosphate coating, and that is the mechanism by which we can protect the public from having a lead pipe by changing the, the chemical composition of the inside of the pipe. And that has worked extremely well. It works as it goes through the copper pipes. If you had lead solder in the older homes where copper pipes are soldered together, it coats those junctions, and it even coats the inside of faucets, which could have some amount of lead in the machining of those, or in the, in the uh, metal fabrication. So that process is working extremely well, uh, as we knew it would. Uh, and, and so we're very happy with that. But if you come for a partial service line replacement and you clip the line here, as, as Mr. Hawkins said, in the process of doing that, you can shake off this film and you can get little pieces of lead coming through, so you have to give good precautions to the people using that for several weeks. But then that film will reestablish itself. So over time, you have now a, a copper pipe or some other metal that's, that's joined with the lead, the, the corrosion inhibitor will we'll repair that and it'll be okay. That's why I said in my statement that we commit, because it's the right thing to do for the chemistry and for the public health, that we will continue to use a corrosion inhibitor indefinitely so that as things happen in the distribution system, people jostle things around or things change, or even if someone were to have some illegal solder and solder connections together, we can take care of that through the water chemistry. So that, that's, a, I think, a, a good news story on the technical side. Yeah. And Mr. Hawkins, you do say you inform people, you inform them a, a long time in advance. It, it just makes me very nervous uh, to think that there are, there's a one-year-old child or a pregnant woman who during that time when pot, uh, uh, orthophosphate is taking hold uh, may, in fact, uh, uh, be contaminated. It's very bothersome, um, although I must say uh, the only thing that saved the hearings we had before was that we learned about orthophosphate. Uh, I'd like to know if you're still using the uh, chloramines uh, to treat drinking water here in the District of Columbia. Yes, that was what was corroding, I understand. Right. The, the, well, the chloramine, the chloramine is a secondary disinfectant that lowers this class of chemicals called disinfection byproducts, which are chronic potential carcinogens. The, just to quickly review, what we found out after the fact, we did not know this ahead of time or obviously we never would have done it. Uh, chloramine was a very effective chemical used widely in the United States to lower the level of disinfection byproducts. We had, under the lead and copper rule in 1991 when it was promulgated, by 1994, between Washington Aqueduct and EPA Region 3, had decided upon a technique which would give optimal corrosion control treatment. And that would be the use of lime to control the pH of the water. What we did not know, and what nobody knew, except looking back a year or so after this, was that the chlorine itself 
in the distribution system was acting as a corrosion inhibitor. And when we changed that to coramine, it, it started chemically eating away at the chlorine film that had been put there. And until we could establish a phosphate film, we, we had that period of time when we had unknowingly disrupted the corrosion control that had existed on behalf of chlorine. And obviously, we never would have done that if we knew the chemistry. And the, the, the out of all of this came a, a lot of thought and a lot of concern. Uh, the, the lead and copper rule was changed nationally uh, to, to be more protective. And I think that uh, a, a very unfortunate situation. We did react quickly, but there was a period of time when people were exposed. Now, so uh, chloramines are or are not still? Horrible. They are still used. And, and what, what is a little bit confusing about this, ma'am, is that uh, when in, the, in the, the late winter, early spring, annually we will change the distribution system chemistry to be more effective at killing bacteria that may have grown in the distribution system, biofilm, if you will. And by letting it see chloramine followed by chlorine for a period of a couple months, it will sort of like spring cleaning. That, again, is a very common practice in the industry. But throughout all of that, we are now using corrosion inhibitor. Had we been using a corrosion inhibitor, an orthophosphate corrosion inhibitor, in 2000, we wouldn't be sitting here today. Yeah. Uh, are, are there other chemicals uh, used to treat this, the city's water? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, we, we add fluoride to the water for dental um, uh, prophylaxis. We, uh, it, to, to, we use, uh, well, of course, lime to, to help change the pH of the water to make it less reactive, the orthophosphate. Uh, to make the, the water coagulate, we use aluminum sulfate. Uh, and of course, the, the disinfectant, the chlorine. Uh, we use various versions, uh, uh, polyaluminum chloride. We use various polymers. These are all done to either enhance the coagulation and sedimentation, or to improve filtration, or to do good solid pH control. Caustic soda is another uh, agent that we use. All of these, all of these chemicals are certified by EPA for water treatment use, but back to the couple comments in my testimony, we have set up these lead pipe loops. We have pipes that have been harvested from the District of Columbia distribution system. And there are arrays of these in the basement of the water treatment plant at Dale Carley on MacArthur Boulevard. And we run water through those and we measure it as simulating the water in a house. And we can see the effectiveness of the day-to-day -day treatment, but we can also use various versions of those loops, various, various uh, we have seven, actually 21 pieces of pipe, but that's okay. Um, that if we want to change chemistry, if we anticipate a change, we will run that water in the proposed chemistry through those pipes and analyze it for a period of time, look at those results with our own consultants, and then go to EPA with those results to then have a very high assurance that any change we make in the future will have been tested on pipes that that water would be expected to see in the District of Columbia so that there would be no unexpected outcome of a future water treatment change. All right, so let, let me, please make me understand who monitors the water supply in the District of Columbia. EPA Region 3 is responsible for enforcement of the Safe Drinking Water Act. For, yeah, for but who monitors the water on a monthly basis? I mean, for example, Mr. Hawkins, oh. Wassa was on the, uh, on the hot seat, frankly, for not, in fact, informing residents uh, about lead in the water. And I am confused still about whose job it is to, uh, to offer this information. I mean, is it Mr. Toulouse's job? It, you know, who, who, whose job is it to tell the public the real deal here, and how often? I misunderstood what you said about monitor. I mean, we send the results to EPA and they, they look for compliance. Washington Aqueduct, as do all water utilities, we are responsible for our own process control. So we you sample the water. EPA, you sent them to EPA in 2000 as well, in, in 2001, right. and 2002, and 2003, and 2004. I'm trying to find out who is responsible for monitoring the water in the District of Columbia, and if there is an issue informing residents about that issue. We share that responsibility here. 
Yes, Congressman, my answer to that is that both the aqueduct and DC, now DC Water, will share that responsibility. As you, knew, as you know, and this is part of our proactive strategy, twice in the last, since I've been on this job, we've had to do a limited boil water alert. We did it as a precaution, but that's because the monitoring that we do, which is in addition to the monitoring the aqueduct does, we now take a, a almost an extreme.